Well then, I will tell you the story of Detective Gumshoe Johnson and his quest to completely miss the plot. The game was a noir affair, set in a dystopian 1930s, where magic sort of existed. Anyways, we were three player characters. Gumshoe Johnson was a private eye and was about as generic as film noir detectives get. Apart from the sawn-off shotgun he always carried, the other two were Schmidt, a snivelling thief and burglar, and Boris, a boxer and medical student, as well as a certified big bloke. When the story begun, Mr Gumshoe did not know the other two, and one summer, when it had rained continuously for several weeks, he got a call about something going down at the harbour. When Gumshoe gets there, he hears a scream from the nearby alleyway and proceeds to investigate. There he finds two thugs assailing a woman after a brief fight, ending with one thug unconscious and the other with a severe case of lead poisoning. Gumshoe gets a clue about a valuable and mysterious artefact having been smuggled into the country. Calling it a job well done, he proceeds home. Meanwhile, our other two heroes are wasting time at a shady bar at the docks when they notice a group of men more secretive than the usual clientele. After some strategical positioning, they manage to overhear them talking about a bag one of the men brought and arguing about the price, wanting to pay lots of money for it instead of shit tons of money the little guy demanded. This is where Schmidt decides that whatever is in the secret bag is worth the steal, and since it's stealing from the mob, it's not too hard to convince Boris to go along with the plan. Smith proceeds to uppercut Boris, who stumbles backwards and lets his entire 7 foot 300 pound frame fall over the mafioso table. In the following commotion, Smith tries to snatch the bag from the mafiosos and leg it, but fails, and have to ditch the bag. After doubling back to Schmidt's car, which Boris has to sit in the back seat with his legs bent over the front seat, they decide to follow the gangsters to their hideout, the same warehouse that Detective Gumshoe was tipped off by the lady he saved. Gumshoe decides to wait until morning before doing anything. After all, he is cold, wet and hungry. And besides, it's late and nothing is going to happen at this hour. In the meantime, Schmidt and Boris has tailed the gangsters to the warehouse. After parking out of sight from the warehouse, and realising that Boris did not bring his 38 revolver, forcing Smith to give him one of his 380 automatics, and half of his magazine, they start sneaking towards the warehouse. Schmidt manages to reach the side door quietly, and picks the lock without a problem. Whilst Boris sneaks about, as well as you'd expect from what is basically an overweight Ivan Drago, despite tipping over a peel of rusty piping, they enter the warehouse undetected spotting the bag on the table in the middle, next to a briefcase full of money. Schmidt sneaks forward whilst Boris stays in a corner behind some boxes. And while Schmidt manages to creep all the way to the table, the second he closes the briefcase and lifts the bag off the table, a door opens to the upper story office and three gangsters show up. One of them wearing a white pinstripe suit and pointing at what should not be considered a large revolver, but rather a small howitzer at Smith, demanding him to give up. However, the gangsters have not noticed Boris. He opens up with the gangsters and manages to get a number of shots at the suit and one of his guns, while Schmidt legs it. Meanwhile, Detective Gumshoe has a warm shower and is preparing to go to a cheap diner for some supper. After some covering fire and a lot of running, Boris and Schmidt manage to find their way back to the car, only to find it being investigated by two more guns. Schmidt manages to tag one in the throat with a throwing knife, but the other takes cover behind the car's engine block and starts to take pot shots at Boris, who drops back and tries to snipe at the gangster's hand whenever he presents himself. Detective Gumshoe reaches his favourite diner and proceeds to enjoy his meal in peace. Meanwhile, Boris is pinning down the last gangster behind the car, whilst Schmidt is creeping around to get a better angle at him. All the while, the shouts of angry and wounded, gangsters and a very large guard dog is growing louder. A critical hit from Schmidt, as he is emptying his last clip into the gangster, puts him out of commission and the two pile into the car as fast as they can. Boris, just managing to pass his agility test to squeeze into the smaller car before Schmidt put his pedal to the metal, cursing Boris for the new ventilation holes his imported car now sports. 
Although his source of anger shifts slightly, when the rear window is perforated by the Suits 44, missing his head with a few inches. After two driving checks, a lot of ammo spent firing wildly at a pursuing car and a critical fail to dodge oncoming traffic, they make it back to Boris's apartment. Boris sporting a new orifice in his left shoulder, but with 50 grand and a small statuette of a cat, carved out of what appears to be Ebenholtz, that makes you feel uneasy if you look at it for too long, and also always feels damp, no matter how much you dry it off. After a botched attempt to stitch his shoulder back together, Boris and Schmidt decide they lay low for a week. Detective Gumshoe decides to go to bed early. During the coming week, Detective Gumshoe decides to look more into the gangster's operations, but finds the warehouse empty, with a few beat cops surrounding it. Apparently there was a shootout at what was supposedly an abandoned warehouse. Slightly disappointed, Gumshoe decides to grab some lunch before heading back to his office and making a call to his client to find out more about this art piece he is being paid to find. After a few days of baked beans and card games, in which Schmidt consistently wins, despite Boris's insistence that there's only five aces in the deck. There's only four. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Schmidt and Boris decide it's time to make a move. After calling Schmidt's brother to pick up some things from his house, and calling in some favours with Boris's university chums, they set off in Boris's beat-up vehicle, generously described as a car, to an old gypsy lady who knows about the ancient arts. Detective Gumshoe gets a lead that a known thief caused a ruckus at a bar down by the harbour and gets his address, proceeding to mount a stakeout at the cafe opposite Schmidt's apartment building. He orders a light lunch while he waits. All this bitch does is eat. Schmidt's brother arrives at the apartment later in the afternoon to find two rather large gentlemen wanting to introduce to him Mr. Blackjack and Mr. Easy Rolled Up Carpet. Detective Gumshoe leaves the cafe, only having seen three men entering the building, not one matching the description of the thief, and two men in coveralls carrying a carpet back to what must have been a moving truck. He decides to call it a day. Elsewhere, Schmidt and Boris find out that the statuette is from a forgotten people from a lost continent, and that according to legend, their entire empire were wiped out by a deity, drowning their land with thunderstorms. Although the expert could not give them monetary value, when they return to Boris's apartment, they find it thrashed, and when going back to Schmidt's car, they find it rigged up with a rather obvious and large satchel bomb. A delicate removal operation later, they find a letter demanding the statuette in exchange for the life of Schmidt's brother. Detective Gumshoe realises that the dishes has been standing for several days and decides to eat another meal at the diner. After all, his client is paying him by the hour. The next day, Detective Gumshoe calls in a favour from an old friend who tips him of another warehouse used by the same guys that used to operate from the old docks. He loads a shotgun, brushes off his fedora (laughs) and takes the next tram to the industrial district. Meanwhile, Boris and Schmidt drops by an old friend of Schmidt's. Boris buying a new 45 automatic and four magazines worth of cartridges and Schmidt a military bolt action rifle with armour piercing ammunition. After bolting some steel plates to the inside of Schmidt's car and propping the statuette in the front seat, they go to the same warehouse to make the exchange. Schmidt and Boris arrive to the scene first in their dime store Sherman tank and is met at the gates by several armed men. Hunkering down behind their car, they prop the statuette on the hood and demand Schmidt's brother to be released. Shortly after one of the goons come out, dragging the brother behind him, and a couple more guards start flanking the car. After running to the car to get this statuette, and then back to leave it to the gangster, the goons start to slowly back off, while Schmidt number two makes his way to his brother and Boris, who promptly make good on their escape, deciding to drop the brother off at the nearest tram station, then doubling back for the statuette. The stakes are too high to give up now. Detective Thomas Gumshoe arrives with the tram and notices a rather familiar man looking very shaken. After shifting his focus to the task at hand, he approaches the warehouse. He attempts to sneak into the courtyard, but is noticed from the inside and a man armed with a 9mm automatic starts firing at him from the guardhouse. Barely missing Gumshoe, who in turn 
redecorate the small gatehouse with buckshot, smashed glass and goon brain matter. This of course triggers the gangsters inside the warehouse to return fire and the unmistakable sound of a 9mm submachine gun fills the air. One botched dodge roll later and Gumshoe is fleeing from the scene, bleeding profusely from his arm and abdomen. Boris and Schmidt hears the commotion and decide to sneak in from the other side of the compound. A running shoulder charge from Boris, a broken down steel door and a barge of pistol fire from Schmidt's twin automatics bring down the machine gunner in the window and forces the other three gangsters to duck and cover behind some rusting machinery. A critical success on a run check. Several volleys of pistol fire and about 200 near misses, Boris finds himself the proud owner of a damp statuette and a slightly used submachine gun. After returning the satchel bomb to its rightful owners, it was the right thing to do. Boris and Schmidt decide to get the hell out of Dodge. Detective Gumshoe manages to reach a small hospital and remains bedridden for several days. Boris and Schmidt arrive at Schmidt's apartment intending to flog the statuette and skip town. When they are greeted by the old woman who had told them the legend of the statuette, according to your old text, this was the wrath of a dead god that had destroyed their continent and the god's last power laid in the statuette that had recently been uncovered in an archaeological dig and then promptly stolen. According to the ancient text, the only way to destroy the power of the god and stop the rain was to stab it with a ceremonial dagger. Of only two were known to exist, one in a museum in a country currently at war with the motherland and the other in a private collection of one Don Gileotelli, head of a completely legit chain of convenience stores and nothing else. Whilst recovering in hospital, Detective Gumshoe is visited by his client, telling him that she knows Don Gileotelli is after the statuette to perform some kind of ritual and that according to your mother, who was a descendant from the long lost people, the ritual could bring ruin to the entire continent. She left him with the address of Don Gileotelli's mansion and a kiss for good luck. Schmidt was first in favour of ditching the statuette and bugging out until Boris reminded him of all the innocent people that would die and the fact that Don Gileotelli was bound to keep the dagger in a vault and that it would not be the only thing in that vault. They decided to sneak into the mansion at night as soon as the full moon had passed and the nights were dark again. Meanwhile, Detective Gumshoe had recovered enough from his wounds and decided it was his duty to stop him and calling forth every favour he had managed to get his hand on a semi-automatic rifle, a bandolier of grenades and a set of police issue riot armour. That night, Boris and Schmidt set their plan in motion. Tossing a carpet over the fence, both men crossed the mansion yard on their bellies before getting to the second story balcony where Boris lifted Schmidt up on his shoulders and shoved him up on it, then creeping around to deal with a par box on the backside. The par cut. Schmidt carefully shimmied the window open and snuck in. After dispacing a goon with an expertly thrown knife, he crept down to the first floor veranda and unlocked the door for Boris. Moving stealthily, or as stealthily as possible for a 7 foot 250 pound man in pitch darkness, they spent the next two hours checking room after room after any sign of a vault or glass display case. It was about 5 in the morning when Detective Gumshoe rammed his car through the mansion gate and then through the front doors, before stepping out of his total car and opening fire with a semi-automatic rifle at the first target to present itself, cutting down the second night guard before he even understood what was going on. Not understanding the situation, but clearly hearing the gunfire, Schmidt and Boris decided their plan had gone pear-shaped and decided to hurry it up, whereupon two guards ran out into the corridor saw the open door and drew their handguns. Detective Gumshoe decided that the time for investigation was over and started his advance into the mansion, shooting rapidly at whatever targets presented themselves and throwing grenades at the ones who didn't. In the meantime, Schmidt failed his draw check, the hammer of his pistol catching onto his suit jacket, and Boris neglected to try, opting instead to throw his considerable bulk right against the mobsters standing in the doorway. Knock them down, allowing Schmidt to clear his pistol, walk over to the groaning pile of meat and ask nicely where the vault was located. 
At roughly this time, Detective Gumshoe had emptied his rifle and borrowed a drum-fed machine gun from one of the Don's security staff and was using to great effect to suppress the remaining mobsters before throwing his last grenade down the corridor. Having emptied his Tommy gun and supply of grenades, he picked up a discarded pistol and proceeded to move deeper into the mansion, bleeding from his old wounds and a few new ones who had managed to penetrate his armour. As the blasts shook through the mansion, Schmidt and Boris ran headlong towards the Don's office and a certain series of display cases, passing a few dazed and confused maids and a lone bodyguard who quickly succumbed to a burst from Schmidt's machine pistol and Boris's 45. Although he managed to shake off a lot of bullets, Schmidt and Boris actually had to find cover behind an armoire and fire several rounds before he went down. After another shoulder charge from Boris, turned an expensive looking door into firewood, Schmidt smashed the display cases, pocketed the dagger and started filling his big sack marked swag with various gold and jewellery. Roughly at this time, Detective Gumshoe entered the mansion's living room and found himself face to face with a man dressed in about half a white suit and pointing a small howitzer at Gumshoe's face. Initiative rolls were made and Thomas Gumshoe got one point over Oliver Galati. Schmidt was about halfway through the display cases when Boris reminded him of the better part of Valor and reminded him that their escape plan was gone with the wind and suggesting they make like trees and leave. Gumshoe got the drop in Galati and emptied his borrowed handgun into his general direction while simultaneously throwing himself into cover behind some furniture. Missing him completely, Oliver took aim and fired his hand cannon, hitting Gumshoe straight in the chest. Gumshoe panted and dropped his unloaded gun and as Oliver Gilliatti turned the corner for the kill shot, he unloaded both barrels of his shotgun point blank into his gut, blowing him a good nine feet across the room, whereupon he rose to his feet, staggered over to the recliner, poured himself a glass of brandy from a decanter on the side table, sunk into the chair and passed out. Meanwhile, Boris and Schmidt ran as fast as they could, with their pockets stuffed with loot. Boris jumped the rear balcony, then turned to catch Schmidt, when the sound of gunfire from the room on the right caused him to run for the tree line beyond the fence, a groaning and complaining Schmidt still in his arms. At this point we declared mission successful. The police showed up about 20 minutes after the shooting had stopped and found Gumshoe still on the scene. He was alive but delirious, raving about mysterious statuettes and doomsday rituals. As they searched the mansions they had found all the guards dead or unconscious and several display cases smashed and emptied. After the investigation into the stolen statuette was halted by the government officials from some secretive branch of the police, the official story was that Detective Gumshoe was investigating a theft when he was attacked by the thieves and killed the mobsters in self-defence. The trials were over quickly and Gumshoe was released with strict warnings not to talk to anyone and not to search for his client. Boris and Schmidt sought out the old lady and gave her the statuette and ceremonial dagger. Neglecting to mention all the other stuff they made off with, they managed to pocket another 100 grand by fencing the jewellery they borrowed. The police never investigated them and a few days later, the heavy rainfall stopped completely. <laughs>